because that I've noticed in all of the sessions that I've attended today is there are incredibly exciting stories from Rwanda. There's so many lessons that uh, um, other countries in Africa and indeed uh, the world can take from there. So I wanted to ask you about your green economy uh, uh, vision, uh, the approach that Rwanda has taken, and especially how you're considering air quality in an urban setting. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, actually, when it comes to green economy, it's it's difficult to define, but we see it as um, uh, you consider different areas, economic areas, economic sectors, and if I come back on urbanization, uh, point of view, and air pollution, uh, the country uh, has a vision to have a green and clean uh, Rwanda, and that has led us to develop a green growth and climate resilience strategy uh, with clear program of actions and some of the actions is to have green city pilot uh, that is now under development under design now uh, so when we developed the strategy we looked at um, what do we have and we looked at the policies that could support the urbanization uh, because if you see how the urban area is set up you have transportation you have energy you have water supply and sanitation you have waste collection you have uh, a lot of things, and we, we went back to see the available policies in different sectors, so it took some time to, to assess the policies, to engage the other stakeholders from different sectors, so that we can buy the idea and have a common vision. Uh, so this has led to uh, a review of different policy sectors, so that when you talk about green urbanization, then you have already dealt with uh, Green energy, you have green transportation, you have uh, the proper waste management, and also how you plan your city to develop in a green way. So what we did uh, after that, of course, there's so many policies that have been reviewed and uh, legal framework to support the urbanization. And then on the ground, we had to, to have some demonstration projects uh, where we tried also to, to deal with uh, uh, ecological infrastructure had, that have been destroyed. Uh, I can talk of the wetland uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, and uh, urban forests to work on that. And again, to include uh, some designs that could also uh, deal with or include elements of green designs to maximize the use of natural ventilation, uh, resource efficient use, and cleaner production. Uh, coming to the um, on the planning level, we also had to, to promote the integrated planning, of course, led by the Ministry of Finance, where different sectors could come together and have integrated planning, uh, so that we can actually use less resources, but you deliver more of the green uh, designs. So we have been reviewing our master plan, Kigali master plan, and to also help the, to reduce the congestion of Kigali city, we have set up six secondary cities to help the uh, Kigali, and the, the six secondary cities are also being, uh, the master plan have been reviewed to cater for the green aspects as we have the master plan developed and to the implementation. But again, in the same uh, line, on the aspect of air quality, when the study showed that most of the areas that are causing air pollution in the urbanization area, it was from transportation. Of course, our cars are old, uh, they all uh, uh, petrol and diesel based. So we have tried to work with transport sector to see how we can actually uh, promote uh, public transport to avoid individual vehicles. But this also goes with sensitization of our, our people to be able to accept uh, to go for public uh, transport. Uh, and again, I can see the bins are not enough, but um, the air quality, we have set air quality monitoring system to be able to, to address, I mean to develop data on how the air quality is changing and be able to address from the root cause. Uh, on the financing, also we tried to see, to set up a green climate fund, the local green climate fund, because most of our people have been complaining they cannot afford the green technologies. But again, on the other side, I think it's just mindset change. Sometimes the cost of investing in green technologies is actually worthy. If you compare, I count it as 
uh, if you can say I'm not going to invest in, 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 the, in the vaccination and let you pay more money for treatment. Thank you. Well, thanks. Three minutes is not enough to learn the Rwanda story, <laughs> that's for sure. But I just want to point out how hugely impressed I am by just the breadth of the vision that, that you hear across ministries and, and in government departments in Rwanda. Joyce, can come to you on, uh, from, from from the UN. Uh, so, if if there is burden or if there is a perception that there is burden happening in a city on air quality, and if there is popular will to it and political buying, all of those are necessary conditions. But we also know that urban bodies, municipal uh, corporations, uh, have two uh, basic gaps. One is just the the, the 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 power to be able to act, and the second is the finances. And I was wondering if you could tell us where your thinking is on, 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 on political power and finances of cities and, and examples of, of that we could learn from. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. You can hear me? Um, so I'm Joyce Isuya. I'm the um, Deputy Executive Director of uh, United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, and within the UN system, I have another had, which I will not touch upon. Just to go straight to, to the question, uh, since we are a global institution, I would like to give specific examples. Uh, and I will cite two examples that I know very well before I answer uh, your question, uh, Hisham. One is China, the other is Kenya. I've, I've lived in both countries, and both countries have their own versions of urbanization and air pollution, but with different sources. So in China, as part of our organization, we actually did a study in Beijing to find out how did Beijing City reduce its air pollution by 35% from 2013 uh, to 2017. And I lived there from 2011 to 2014. Uh, what you mentioned, Hisham, as key ingredients, vision, leadership, etc., was key, but equally important was the financing. But in assessing the financing needs, we had to look at what is the source of pollution. If you know Beijing, it sits in the valley. So one of the sources was the Tianjin, Benjin provinces surrounding Beijing, which sits in the valley, and all the pollution from the manufacturing sector was actually getting trapped in Beijing. The second was cars, transport system, and source of energy in Beijing. So the combination of manufacturing sector that has driven the export-based uh, economy and the urban transport. And in terms of financing needs, we had to come up with a package of options. Why? Because transitioning manufacturing sector into cleaner uh, uh, industrial base uh, does require transitional costs, and that is a long-term proposition. Whilst on the other hand, to deal with the urban transport challenges, those are issues around policies. How do you control cars that get into Beijing city? How do you, as uh, Coletta mentioned, uh, transition from diesel, petrol-based to cleaner e-mobility cars? So I think a key ingredient of determining financing options is actually doing a diagnosis to find out what are the sources of pollution. Going back to Kenya, where I live now, there is a bit of air pollution, and most of it is driven from source of energy and transport because of the demographics shifts to Nairobi city. So there, again, the story is very different. How do you transition uh, a whole city uh, to a cleaner transport? But equally important, how do you move from diesel generators, source of energies, to cleaner? What do we see at the global level? We see a combination of options available for countries and private sector. One is the multilateral, bilateral finances. The Green Climate Fund is one, GF is another, but also there are bilateral loans uh, that usually tend to happen between countries. We also see for bigger economies or economies that can afford or small countries with good revenues, domestic revenues play a key role in financing. Uh, air pollution. Uh, grants, including my organization, we fundraise and we support as a catalytic effect to support small projects. But also there are bonds uh, that have been established by different municipalities, by cities. For example, Singapore has a, one of the most successful uh, bonds. 
as well as public-private partnerships, again, all depending on the sources of air pollution in urban cities. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, your organization does some fascinating work on uh, uh, sustainable production of agriculture, fisheries, mining, uh, none of which is in a city. Uh, why should cities be bothered by the work that you do? Uh, and if they are bothered or if they are affected by it, what lessons can they learn from the work you do? Thank you, Hisham. Uh, I'm Sam Ongala. I coordinate the Climate Work for Solidarity Network for the African continent, based in Accra right now. Uh, we have over 50 years of experience working uh, the value and supply chain uh, in the agricultural sector and also in the mining sector. I think uh, the question is, uh, with urbanization and air pollution, the growing of mega cities, of which we know uh, Africa countries are among the mega cities that will be coming up in the, between now and 2030, how do we feed the urban cities without weaponizing nature through air pollution? How do we respond to the need, the food need? How do we feed these urban cities? and yet maintain a low carbon development pathway, especially in the agricultural sector. We know that after the uh, energy sector, agriculture is the second largest emitter of greenhouse gas emission, and also invariably a source of uh, air pollution. So if we need to feed the mega cities, and we need to address these challenges in the urban centers with the growing population, then we need to adopt some measures, drastic measures, at the farm level, where the food comes from to feed this population in the mega city. And we know that some of the practices in the agricultural sector and the mining sector are not sustainable, and they contribute to these emissions. What are some of the practices we notice uh, at the farm level, at the mill level, and at the factory level that we're talking about? If you look at the farm level, we have emissions that emanate from uh, slash and burn kind of agricultural practices. We have emissions that emanate from the aspect of indiscriminate use of agrochemicals and other agro inputs. We have uh, deforestation related activities. And we also have activities at the farm level in the farm that are dependent on high energy uh, uh, equipment require a, low, a high carbon dependent energy source. So how do we address this? And some of the emissions that are associated with these practices at the farm level, at the mill level, and at the factory level include the particulate matters which are injurious to health and also affect the urban health and urban air pollution. We also look at the aspect of another uh, emissions that emanate from agricultural practices such as uh, the formaldehyde that comes from some of the agrochemicals we use, and also what we call the volatile uh, 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 emissions that comes from some of the practices, and then carbon dioxide emissions, CO2, as well as methane. All these have their presence from some of the agricultural practices. So in such way, what do we do then to address these sources of air pollution from the agricultural sector? through our work. We embark upon sustainable agriculture, and there is sustainable intensification. How then do we produce more with less, and from the same source of land? And then we adopted, and using the climate uh, smart lens, conservation agriculture and climate smart mining, we also adopted a digital agriculture, whereby we provide some of the farmers that we work with with digital uh, technologies that they need to use, especially in terms of how much of these agrochemicals they need, what do the soil require, how much of the chemicals you need to apply, what is the weather condition, what is it going to be like, so that then that reduces the amount of emission that comes from the agrochemical uh, use. We also uh, look at the aspect of uh, reducing emissions at farm level through the deployment of some uh, state-of-the-art technologies. Now, when you look at some of the emissions from the agro uh, machineries, 
that are coming up. They are the result of some of the practices that are dependent and the machinery that dependent on the fossil fuel. And then we start with the promotion of switching into the renewable energy source, solar source. Uh, we start providing solar uh, panel for irrigation farming, changing from sprinkling uh, irrigation to drip irrigation system. And because when you trace back the carbon footprint related to water management, you will then trace it back again to the energy source, which is highly on fossil fuel. We also provide uh, our farmers and the stakeholders we work with with training and education on how to adopt some of the best practices, call it the best management practices along the agricultural uh, value chains and the supply chain. We also promote what we call the farmer field schools and also rural service center and demonstration farms because farmers want to see what works before they adopt it. And so these are some of the things we, we bring in on board and also linking them with the source of finance, making agriculture a business, not let me just feed and have it like that, but how do we make agriculture a business for the farmers? Once they see the business perspective of it, they have access to finance and they have access to innovation and technology. Some of these things we are talking about, it helps them to also address the impact of climate change, build their resilience to the impact of climate change, at the same time helping them to keep the emission uh, level low at the farm, at the factory, and at the mill uh, level. These are some of the practical uh, things we're doing across the value chain and the supply chain. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Emily, your organization is essentially an innovation hub. But one of the other fascinating things about it is that it is also a convening body that is able to get a really diverse set of stakeholders. Uh, and one of the challenges of air quality in urban settings or in any setting is you need a really diverse set of stakeholders. What lessons can the small but growing air quality community learn from some of the other bigger communities out here like public health? Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Sheldon. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the African Health Innovation Center. We're based in Accra, Ghana, and we really believe in leveraging innovation and entrepreneurship to try to improve health outcomes. And like was mentioned, we generally do this by working with very, very diverse stakeholders. So we teach business models to young health startups, but we also work directly with hospitals and health providers. And in addition to that, we teach innovative concepts like human-centered design to international organizations and more traditional development delivery groups. So in our work, we try to bring everyone together. And the truth is that this is not very typical for the entrepreneurship community, right? Uh, in, in entrepreneurship, we like to move fast. We like to pivot. We like to be flexible. And that's often hard to do in collaboration with the government. But we know that in health, we don't have the opportunity to leave major players out of the conversation, whether it's because of regulation, whether it's because they have access to a large portion of the population. And I, I think with air quality, it's really the same, that you have to bring all of these different people to the table. And when we're looking at public health issues, we found that when you have very long-term risks, it's hard to get people motivated. Right? Everyone's worried about how they're going to feed their families this evening, not whether someone's going to be sick in 50 years. So what we've done is we've tried to partner with different institutions to tie some of our long-term risks to shorter-term impacts. So to give you a couple of examples, when we look at communities that have very high crime rates, that is a very big public health issue. It's a very big concern for us, and there are very long-term implications. But there's also short-term, immediate implications for businesses in that area. So how can we partner with the economic community to help decrease violence in the area for business-related reasons, which tends to have a faster motivation rate? At the same time, when we looked at the HIV crisis, uh, and a couple of decades ago this really started, you know, we knew that HIV was increasing. We knew that it had very real implications. But it wasn't until people started seeing that their employees couldn't turn up for work that we saw the private sector really come in and start launching their own health centers on site at large-scale corporations. And we saw a dramatic reduction in mother-to-child transmission of HIV. 
Uh, right now, our organization has been running, over just the past couple of weeks, a series of workshops in four regions throughout Ghana where we were bringing together clinicians and academicians to talk about how they could use innovation to improve health. And we were using emergency medicine as the example. So we had them break into small groups and use post-it notes and ideate around what are some of the challenges in emergency medicine, what are some of the potential solutions. And a nurse at Tamale Teaching Hospital stood up on behalf of her group and she said, you know, we have a really, really big issue with roads, especially during the rainy season, but in general. There's so many potholes, there's so much flooding. Even when we do have access to an ambulance, it can't get to the hospital in time. But what if, what if we partnered with an agricultural business in our area that was also having problems using a rough road to get their product to the market? And together we rallied and we created a public-private partnership with the government to help develop that road for both economic and health reasons simultaneously, right? So these examples aren't necessarily specific to air pollution, but they are about this idea that if we can think about this long-term risk, which is the impact on you know, climate change and the environment, but also the impact on our own individual health, and we can tie it to a short-term impact, and I often think of one that's economic because of our work, um, we can usually bring together diverse stakeholders in a very new and unique way. Um, I was going to uh, move on to what's I mean, the logic for the clean energy revolution is there, the, the, the math seems to be adding up, what are the barriers that are preventing the world from realizing, hopefully realizing faster the clean energy revolution, uh, and are there examples from cities that, that uh, we could get inspiration and, and hope from? Absolutely. Uh, so let me just introduce myself. My name is Ritu Lal and I represent a, uh, a solar energy uh, company called Amplus Energy Solutions. We're based in India and we're about five years old. We began as a startup and we are now uh, India's largest uh, rooftop solar company. So the solar revolution has certainly taken off and the prime reason behind this is the viability, so what they call grid parity. And about at least 50% of the cost of generating solar energy comes from what you call solar modules or solar panels. And about five years ago, the prices became half of what they were five years back. And that is what is really driving the adoption of solar. India has taken to solar in a large way, probably in the top five solarized countries in the world today. Uh, and with, you know, we've helped form the ISA, the International Solar Alliance, which has a lot of uh, countries in its membership. And this should be growing, uh, you know, exponentially every year. Just from the Indian example, the amount of rooftop solar that we had in 2018 or uh, 2017 doubled in the last year, so 2018 doubled capacity. But we are still scratching the surface. Uh, it's an ideal solution to the urban setup because unlike other renewable sources like you know, small hydro plants or wind plants, they tend to be very large and you can generate electricity from a single small solar module. So you can be producing one unit of electricity per hour and there are the larger rooftops, like take this hotel or you take large manufacturing setups where we have, you know, megawatt scale, so you can have two, four thousand, six thousand megawatts on a single rooftop. So, the one brilliant thing about it is land is very expensive, you know, if you look at all cities, right? Or even, uh, you know, agricultural land is important. So when you set up solar farms, you take up land. It's not possible in today to set up solar farms which are very remote because you need to build up a very strong grid infrastructure to wield that electricity. So with rooftop solar, you don't need any land. You use what is already available and has no other, you know, so you look at the roof of this hotel. They're not going to be able to do anything else over there. Uh, we can set solar on a metallic uh, sheds, uh, the roofs of factories. So we use what we call dead commercial space. Uh, the second thing is we don't require any infrastructure to carry that electricity. Because we set up all these plants 
in areas which already have grid electricity. So it uses, you know, if even if that electricity is exported into the grid. The other option is that you use it internally. So you don't have to create any grid infrastructure, which takes time and takes a lot of money. And uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why remote areas today across the developing world, including India, where we have 300 million people outside electricity, because it takes a lot of effort to take the grid infrastructure. So we're now working on ways again using solar in rural setups with batteries to give them electricity. So there is no cost of infrastructure. The third great advantage is that there is absolutely no loss in transmission or distribution. Now again, if you look at the developing world, because of technical reasons and of course there's a lot of theft of electricity. As you know, uh, they say that for every two units which is produced, only one unit finally makes it. And even if the numbers are lower, even for us, including, uh, I think in areas it's like 30-40% of losses. Here the losses are less than 1% because the electricity is produced and consumed at the same space. So if you add all of these aspects, then the net cost of solar from a rooftop plant is not that much different from a utility scale plant because these three and four cent tariffs that we're talking about per unit, there are the cost of generation. That's not the cost of supply at the point of consumption. And uh, technically speaking, the other advantage is that because uh, these solar plants are literally distributed across thousands of roofs in a metropolitan area, what they call balancing the grid becomes easier because solar will only generate as long as the sun is out. So if, they know, if there is a sudden cloud cover, it, uh, typically it will not cover a 40 square mile radius at the same time. So then you have a balancing which becomes a lot easier. So this is one reason why we can promote a lot of rooftop solar. And if you look at my company, you know, we, uh, we began as one startup. Uh, to, we have over 200 uh, clients today. So right now we're working exclusively in the commercial and industrial setup. Because uh, the other thing that's important, the reason it's growing, is because we offer what we call the RESCO or the OPEX model, where we sell solar power as a service. So it is still investment heavy, if you look at, uh, you know, the, and the technology keeps changing. So if you were to take your own, you know, you have a rooftop and you want to put up your own plant, you get into questions of what panel should I be using, how should I be integrating. Uh, it's the design expertise is very important because if you go wrong at the design time, there is nothing you can do and you'll just be compromising the capabilities of your plant. And the plant life is about 25 years. So what we do is we do the investment, we own that project, we maintain that project for about 25 years and we sell all the electricity that's produced to the rooftop owner. So it gives them a completely risk-free, there's no finance operation or technical risk. And we ensure that the pricing is cheaper than what they buy from the grid. So for every unit of solar consumed, they make a saving. This has become the biggest deterrent to the growth of solar. Because what this does is the distribution company that sells electricity, they start to lose a part because you only replace about 15 to 50 percent of any rooftop owner's electricity requirements. So because the distribution companies begin to suffer revenues, then they create impediments for the growth of rooftop solar. So that's the other reason, sorry about the big builder, why it is not growing because it's, you know, it is a win-win for everybody except the distribution companies. So I will not go into the details, but what we're trying to do now is to make, come up with a tariff solution which ensures that the distribution company also kind of shares the profit so they, that you know, the, the model can proliferate. And uh, because the same tariff structure exists across all developing countries where we subsidize agricultural sectors, we subsidize the domestic users, and we sell expensive electricity to factories and commercial enterprises. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I'm going to make a slight change. I'm going to have just one follow-up question and then we'll throw it to the audience. Joyce, I was actually going to direct it to you. Uh, how do we, you know, what forums or, or, or mechanisms are there, apart of course from the Kigali Global 
uh, dialogue where we're all hanging out and, and, and chatting about this. But what else is out there for us to be able to take lessons from, you know, Ghana and, and, and Rwanda and, 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 uh, and India uh, and spread them out? Because the challenges are going to be the same, you know, the way Ritu articulated the problems with uh, the electricity, the, the political economy of electricity is going to be fairly similar in many countries. Um, so how, how, how does this sharing happen and what, how can we do more of it? Thank you, Hashim. Um, look, I think in terms of sharing, we'll have to segment the looking back, the lessons, looking at Rwanda and other countries and what entrepreneurs are doing and the lessons extracted from that, and then the looking forward. Uh, on the former, uh, the, uh, frankly, I think this kind of platform is excellent, and I want to congratulate the organizers, particularly ORF, for bringing such a diverse group of audience. Uh, but also globally, what we see is there are e-learning courses that anybody can take. For example, the MIT and other universities are offering just free courses to extract, that extract lessons from different parts of the world. People-to-people uh, -people learning, part of the advantages of this session is actually the corridor chats and the networks that get developed. Case studies, which have been archived, Again, a good resource. Uh, nowadays, there are even apps uh, that one can download on smartphones and just finding out what has happened in one part of the world, etc. And lastly, I think organizations such as ours, most of you are members or your governments are members of private sector, civil society, students. That is what we do for a living, to provide a service by bringing different parts of uh, the world's experience to, to a global public good. I think looking forward in terms of what, especially with the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence is really thinking about innovation and investments in research and development. How do we leverage that to actually share? I mean, we were studying, for example, the drone phenomenon, how it's being used here in Rwanda in, to deliver uh, environmentally uh, focused services. So again, thinking ahead 20, 30 years from now, and, uh, skill set uh, development for the young generation to capture that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, from the audience, if there are questions, uh, is, or oh, the mics are on either side, or oh, actually there's something in the middle as well. If you could just tell us your name, uh, your organization, and the question as quickly as you can so that we can then uh, pass it back to the, uh, the panelists. Okay. The lady on that side. So my name is Barbara Amuna. Uh, I come from Ghana. I work with Robert Bosch. My first question is to Samuel. Um, I know that your um, the, the activities you currently do are more related to farmers who are still using the very traditional methods of farming. But I'd like to ask, especially for Accra, you know how congested Accra is, and now um, the farmers are mostly found outside Accra. Are you looking at interventions where we can actually um, implement agricultural activities in Accra. My, uh, my curiosity actually led me to the discovery of aquaponics, and I think it's a great idea. It can actually clear the air where you're using water and fish to farm, which is one intervention we could look at. So are you looking at um, um, such interventions for the, for the urban areas? besides the one we join outside in the crowd. And then my second question goes to engineer Paul Coletta. I would really like you to share. Um, a country like Ghana, we don't develop cities. What we do is that the population grows and then we try to develop according to the population. And you rightly indicated that in Rwanda you're actually developing six new cities. How do you ensure that uh, um, um, the population is evenly distributed around these locations. Because you look at the example of um, Nigeria, when the capital was moved from Lagos to Abuja over two decades ago, you still realize that a lot of the population is still in Lagos, over 20 million. And yeah, because economic activities actually takes place in, in, in Lagos. So how do we ensure that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh the lady here, and if you could just keep the questions as short as possible so we have as much time to respond to them. We'll respond to both of the questions that came there. All right, um, my name is Miss Chikot Naka Izi. I'm from Nigeria. I'm an uncle and a broadcaster. And um, my question is more like an open question and also dovetailing from 
what the lady from Ghana also said. I am looking at how the rural communities can be carried along in this uh, carbon air pollution because when you look at it holistically, most of the industries are located at the outskirts of the cities, particularly in rural communities. So how can we entrench these policies and the recommendations we've been talking about here and in this firm to the minds of the local populace who have no access to electricity and also the internet? Yes, uh, Jen Porphy Morlow with the New Climate Economy. And I was uh, interested to ask the panelists if they could tell us about clean cooking and policy advocacy in that area or good practice policy examples. And uh, in particular, I just looked up since I've been here what share of uh, Rwandans cook with. Uh, clean fuels, and I found 98%, well, at least it was on the website. I don't know if that's true, and maybe the, the minister could, could tell us about that. Sure. Thank you. There's a gentleman on the right. Are you? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. My name is Rasta. I uh, work for the government of Canada, speaking in my personal capacity. This topic is interesting to me because I've lived in several places where air pollution is a real issue. Mexico City, Tehran, Kabul. They all share something in common, which is this being in a valley and trapping everything. For me, it's a bit of a, I think, listening to you, and someone alluded to this at the beginning, it's, it's a political decision, effectively, I think. It's, there's solutions to this, but also because air pollution is a, a, a slow killer, it doesn't seem to be taken. I was surprised, especially in Mexico, for instance, where air pollution is horrible, not taken as seriously as other issues like, for instance, crime, even though I suspect air pollution kills far more people than crime does. So my question to whomever wishes to answer is, how to grab the attention of the decision makers to take this issue seriously, given that for anyone, for an administrator, like for, for a term, a four-year term, it's, it's not much of a win for any politician because, of course, the issue outlives them, unlike, for instance, crime. Sure. Thanks. Um, Sam, can I start with you? And uh, are we planning to? Are you planning to work in the urban settings? And if you could also just quickly touch on how rural communities get uh, get involved and feel a stake in that. Yeah, thank you, my sister from uh, Accra. I think one thing we need to also uh, come to time with is that the atmosphere is shared. And so uh, it doesn't matter where the emission source is coming from, but we're all going to suffer whether you live in the urban centers or you live in a rural center because we share the same space. So and that is why we focus in uh, right now, and uh, we cannot do everything, emission at source, especially in the rural areas. But I completely agree with you that we can do something also in the urban areas where, uh, like in Accra, where we also see other uh, emission at level and also we have been examples of countries and cities that are embarking on uh, urban farming, like uh, Coletta has mentioned. How do we then promote urban farming? Uh, also, there are uh, farming practices now that you don't even need the soil to grow your vegetables and some of the crops you need. So these are examples we can do in Accra. If we don't have land to farm, uh, what are the basic things we can do? So then it reduces our dependency of food from coming from uh, maybe uh, Komasi or Brahapo region. And then because if we tackle the, we reduce our dependency on, on the food coming from those areas, it also helps to control the level of emissions. So uh, we are going to be exploring that particular aspect, especially the urban farming. But in the meantime, we want to like tackle it at source, which is also uh, at the rural area where they feed the Accra, because Accra feeds on the rural areas, most especially. And that you can also link closely with the uh, energy component. Some of the energy needs in the urban centers and uh, satisfying the energy uh, need of the emerging uh, mega cities comes from even the rural area, they bring charcoal and trees are being cut down, and these trees are supposed to sequester carbon and help us address air pollution. So as long as the demand for energy in the urban centers in the city keep rising because of the rising population, because of uh, other factors, and we didn't start with uh, at that level in the rural areas, 
our trees will keep going down, we'll still be having the same problem because the atmosphere is shared. So uh, that is an area we need to, to explore further, especially urban agriculture. Uh, I know some examples are coming up in Egypt and uh, some part of Ethiopia, and I think we can uh, explore that uh, uh, further. Um, about uh, the aspect of uh, Ian, we talk uh, about uh, uh, the aspect of uh, uh, cooking stove and advocacy. What we are currently doing with the University of Ghana is to pilot uh, energy efficient cook stoves, especially for the oil palm sector. We discovered that at the new level where they process oil, uh, oil palm, there is a lot of emissions uh, emanating from that uh, com component because they use uh, the biomass and even car tires to generate uh, heat to cook the oil palm. And we did the analysis, the research with the University of Ghana to determine the quantity of emission coming from the conventional, I mean, uh, use of car tires and biomass. And again, biomass, again, we're decreasing the number of trees that should also help us uh, in carbon sequestration and also help us uh, maintain clean air in the urban centers. So we designed uh, currently and we're piloting in six regions in Ghana the clean uh, energy efficient cook stove and we discovered that it has held uh, benefits, especially for women who are engaged at this level. If you talk about indoor and uh, outdoor uh, pollutions coming from this energy source, we dis discovered that it has health benefits and it will reduce a lot of health hazard uh, implications relating to air pollution from that emission source. We also discovered that a lot of uh, carbon emissions will be sequestered if we use the clean uh, cook stoves. We also discover another benefit of the renewable energy source, which we call it uh, waste to energy. The waste coming from the agricultural uh, practices and products, uh, uh, productions, can we turn them back into renewable energy? Can we turn the hoods from cocoa and the chars from the oil palm? Can we turn them into briquettes? Can we turn the pome, the, the, the palm oil uh, meal effluent, into uh, bio uh, biogas? that then we can use it again to make energy available for cooking, even the oil palm. So these are areas we are reinventing and looking and making the resources in such a way that we don't jeopardize further the environment and, like I said earlier, we panize nature and also help us to maintain a low carbon uh, agricultural practices and development pathway. So we are introducing that uh, uh, already. I, I, I just got it. Thing. So I'm going to just, sorry to rudely interrupt, I wanted to try and get to Colette and just ask her the question about city planning uh, and, and, and how do we manage that to try and minimize some of the, uh, the, the quality of life challenges that inevitably come up. Um, Thank you very much. Um, what, what we are doing actually is to involve the communities. Uh, we go down to the local area and we involve everybody, we look at the opportunities in that particular area and when we, we try to develop the industrial zone that will be close to a certain city, we look at the potentials that are within that particular area. So we expect people will be getting jobs because most of our people move to urban areas, they look for good jobs and better lives. That's how we do it. Um, can I also say something on cook, cook stoves? And, yes. Uh, on the part of cook stoves, what we are doing as government, we actually Did introduced... You have is it 98% or not? Is that the actual number of uh, uh, households using clean uh, uh, cooking gas? Um, I'm not sure whether it's already yet, <laughs> yes. But actually what we do, we have a program on, on how to promote these cook stoves and other alternative energy for cooking like biogas. Uh, there's a government program that deals with the, with the institution of biogas, these big institutions like schools, like police, like, um, you know, prisoners. So we promote biogas use, but also complemented with use of LPG. And then you have uh, a program on domestic, on domestic biogas. And then you have a program that was initiated by His Excellency the President uh, on, to complement the one cow per family and mostly on poor families. So it's integrated planning where you have 
uh, at the IDP, we call it integrated green model village. You construct it for the poor people. So when you give the biogas, you, be, you, be, you give cows, then you connect the toilets to feed into the biogas to help people use clean energy instead of relying on, on charcoal and, and firewood. And again, on the same, uh, we are promoting the use of LPG in specific in urban areas to reduce the use of charcoal. On the, on the good stove issue, because I think that this is a really important point, this point about it being holistically connected. Because we have scientific research that shows us that cook stoves lead to negative health outcomes, okay? We know that when you're, especially when you're cooking indoors, it increases respiratory stress, and it can also lead to cancers. At the same time, we know that clean cook stoves help uh, completely reduce these problems, okay? They're not eliminated, but it reduces significantly. However, there's low to no scientific research that shows when clean cook stoves are introduced to homes that health outcomes actually improve. So we know that this is a problem. We know that we have a solution. But the fact is that most clean cook stoves change the way that food tastes for families. Uh, we also see this idea of like a bonus stove. So if you introduce a clean cook stove, but you leave the other stove behind, suddenly you just have two stoves and you can cook your rice on one and you can cook your stew on another and your evening continues. So I think actually the clean cook stove movement within the innovation sector is one of the most important issues to examine because it shows us that having the solution isn't enough. How we implement it and how it's introduced in communities is the only thing that will actually determine if there are health outcomes improved because of it. I can, take a, I can take on the Canada, the sure. question from the colleagues yeah. from Canada. Um, uh, what we have found, uh, politics or politics clearly, and I haven't been a politician, but what I can tell you is where we have seen politics needle to move, three things have happened. One is when data becomes available to everybody, particularly to the public, dating citizens, what does it mean when you see the red bar? So just awareness of what a PM 2.5 reading of over 300 means, that's one. Two is um, uh, citizens' empowerment through advocacy. So lots of NGOs in many countries, developed and developing, really empowering the citizens to say, if you're seeing your grandmother coughing blood, it may be because of air quality. And third, at the policy level, uh, uh, policy making level, is actually calculating, especially for um, Canadian government or multilateral organizations or NGOs, the opportunity cost of not addressing the impact of air pollution, that if you don't do this, your fiscal budget on health is likely to do why. But what we have observed, including on countries that I will not mention here, the PM 2.5 puts political pressure on citizens, in some cases, voting politicians out because of non-action. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I was going to give a, a slightly twist, uh, a slight twist to this last uh, question, which is part of what needs to happen is you need political pressure to push through policy barriers that are out there. Um, and I'm asking this as, you know, uh, a specialist in the field, but also as a citizen, what can we all do to generate that political pressure? Um, because it is what is going to push barriers down, it's going to you know, create demand, um, and it's going to hold the system to account. Oh, so that's a difficult question. And again, uh, if you look at where I live, and uh, I live in a suburb of New Delhi, but uh, India has a very complex federal structure of government. So I live in a different state, a different province from Delhi. And there is a third province, which is also a suburb. So all of us with different government. But the air doesn't know that. So you know, if you pollute the air of the suburb I live in, it carries into Delhi. And every year around October, and I, Hisham and I incidentally are neighbors, uh, it, it's a huge problem because the air is so bad because about 200 <laughs> kilometers north of where we live, uh, they have harvested the paddy crop. And the cheapest way they can clear out their land is by setting fire to the stubble that remains. 
and the air becomes unbearable. You will all have at that time, wherever you're in the world, if you're traveling to India, you'll be told to postpone. We don't have that option, we live there. So what we've done is started to put a lot of pressure on governments. And I think slowly, because again, a country like India, resources are very limited. I know we, have, you know, we spend a lot of money in a lot of places, but they're, they're tackling things, they're bringing in electric mobility in a very big way. I still think the four-wheeler segment is far off, but you look at the profusion of electric vehicles that has come in, at least the daytime generation of uh, emissions from cars will come down. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you look at you know, the, the storage as it comes in, because one of the reasons solar is not picked up is because storage is very expensive. But uh, we use a lot of diesel generators in India, 40 gigawatts of diesel generators in India. And 40 gigawatts is the target of rooftop solar, of which we're sitting at about four today. And most of these diesel generators are like, you know, home assembled, so they're extremely polluting. So if you use storage along with a solar or any other form of, you know, generating system, it's still cheaper than diesel generation. And which is also the point uh, President Nashid was making in the morning when he said that Maldives was able to transition at a commercially viable price because Maldives was generating all its electricity. Most island states do that through diesel generator. They don't have access to coal and thermal power plants. So for them, it, the, the change makes immediate commercial sense. So these are the kind of things that we can do and uh, hopefully, eventually, governments will wake up. Yeah, yes, please. Uh, I think uh, we need also to have data, as you put it clear. If I want to negotiate with the Minister of Finance to allocate some money for uh, green investment, then I have to show what are the impacts if you don't do that. Uh, and I think this has worked where when we did the vulnerability index and show I mean, climate change, you could indicate what are the future it's, it's going to look like if you don't invest in, in a green investment. And also we have been working on natural capital accounts to see when you conserve the environment, what will be the contribution to the conservation of the environment as you, 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 you develop or you, you, you promote your economic benefits. Uh, and I want to say this because recently we were discussing with, um, on, on, on this electric mobility and I was saying, and I would like to share from you, uh, you say you, have, you are importing cars, uh, you import fuel, uh, you import spare parts, the only thing you have as made in Rwanda is a driver. And then you look at the future of this country, if you continue like this, where are we heading? But yet you can have our own electricity and maybe you import car. But at least you have a driver and the electricity to run the cars. Yeah, thank you. And it's right there. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I just want to give one summary. Uh, the, the statistics are grim, but what you need is you need the politics on your side, you need the, the economics on your side, and you need the technicals on your side. And, uh, you know, with the point that uh, Colette and, and, and Joyce made earlier about data, we're getting there. The technical solutions uh, that, that, that Ritu spoke about, they're all available out there. And the beauty is that the economics is on our side. So uh, I don't want you to leave this panel feeling pessimistic. There is hope in the air, no pun intended. Thank you very much.